Thank you, John. There are so many marketing opportunities suggesting themselves tonight, aren't they? Like um, a phone that tells poets when to stop. That would be so interesting. And when to start. And when to do other things. And also, John and I are not the only poets tonight who will take off glasses and put them on again and put on different glasses. And there must be some marketing opportunity for a pair of special poetic glasses you can only see poems through. That would be a great idea. And also, just I think the poets and I get very addicted to this idea of being here in front of this big audience. I think next year, a bit like Strictly Come Dancing, we ought to do a stadium tour. That would be so much fun. Perhaps start in small stadiums, like that one in Bacup. Uh, so I do tweet a lot. As people know, I'm a king tweeter. Every morning, I tweet my early stroll. And on a recent early stroll, I saw this amazing thing. I saw a man in a camouflage jacket walk past a man in a high-vis jacket, and they cancelled each other out. And <laughs> it was the most wonderful visual thing. And when I was trying to think of a way to describe Fiona Benson's poems, that moment came to mind. Because somehow, the man in the camouflage jacket, who was hiding things from us, and the man in the high-vis jacket, who was illuminating things for us, when they passed each other, became somehow greater than each other. And it seems to me that's what Fiona's poems do. They celebrate the hidden and the brightly visual at the same time. And in that celebration and that contemplation, they create something new. There's an idea in one of the poems about moonlight trapped between the snow still falling and the white earth. And it seems to me that's where Fiona's poems are in this interesting liminal space between the falling snow, the white earth, the camouflage jacket, the high-vis jacket. There are poems here that grow from hidden histories, camouflage history, if you like, through a kind of high-vis present to babies and, and childhood. And in the middle of this book, there's a fantastic sequence about Van Gogh and a couple of lines where Van Gogh says, teach me to admit a touch more light. And I think, gosh, that takes me back to the high-vis man, the camouflage man, but it's not a glimpse of light, and it's not a shard of light, and it's not a, a, a little inkling of light, but it's a touch, a touch more light. And I think that's what Fiona does so well. She touches light in all her poems and lets us experience it. So please welcome Fiona Benson. Thank you so much. Um, I'm honoured beyond belief to be here. I'm going to start with a poem from um, the Vincent van Gogh sequence. Portrait with a bandaged ear. You show up at my door, weeping, exhausted, a rag tied under your chin like a corpse, mumbling, Cherie, Cherie. I draw you a bath, soak your dirty underclothes, heat soup. You sit by the fire in my mother's old house coat and doze. When you wake, you've turned. You tell me I stink. Open every window to the wind. Throw water all over the bed as if our old love burned. Shout whore, whore, whore as you leave. You show up at my door, drunk but lucid, your right ear healed to pearly pink buds, the naked hole in your head flecked with wax. You eat stew right out of the pan and keep me informed. Mannequins talk filth. They are hungry and bored. They would like to be saved. Birds ventriloquize the damned, sins that make you muffle your head and shake. You say you'd like to be well. You shove bread in your pockets for later and walk back into the cold. You show up at my door. The veins stand out on your temples. Your nose is pinched and thin. Angels have voices that spin and shine. 
and must be listened to side on. These window box geraniums, for instance, spilling crimson petals on the road, are a council for bloodletting, leeches. You'll interpret their signs for the world. Oh, you choose them over me. Then come stumbling home, three toes lost to frostbite, a crust of blood on your upper lip, and I let you in, and I let you in, and I let you in. Remember the long afternoons of our youth, spent wrapped in the covers, as if night would never come. How fierce you were, and clear back then. Now I find you stirring in the chamber pot for signs, or stood in the kitchen, your bare blue limbs shining, looking for knives. Shuri, Shuri, we're running out of grace. Men will come and ask me to confirm your name. I want you strong and well. Please stay. The next couple of poems um, are written out of the experience of motherhood. And the first one I'll read, Demeter, is um, basically how becoming a mother turns you into a crazy person. <laughs> Demeter. Up in Sean Drake's meadow, the hay bales shine. They're sheathed in plastic tubing, and the plastic is slack at each end, then tight round the bale like a film. My daughter is compelled. She must fit her arms round each bale, or pull at their silver tails and I cannot draw her home. I head down the path, hoping she'll come, but when I look back, she's gone, and my own voice snags at her name like barbed wire on skin. When I see her again, she's halfway down the field, emerging from behind another bale, as if they were portals or wormholes to pass her through this sun-bleached meadow Impossible, her mouth is bruised with blackberry juice and she keeps disappearing the way a cormorant will dive then reappear a mile up river, disappearing as if into hell through the shadow of a hay bale. Demeter will be screaming soon, cutting her wrists with broken glass, rubbing in dirt, turning the world to darkness and ice. She misses her daughter so much pathological, black ice on a school run, shuddering cars, bodies through glass. She can't bear it, and I can't stand it. Not that small, smashed body on the road, nor the germs, septicemia, meningitis, her small, blotched body in my arms, nor the men preparing underground rooms, their mattress and a bucket, concealed stairs. What mother could find you there, digging up the pavement with her nails? I can't bear it, and I cannot pray enough to spare it. I'll pray to any listening God to keep her safe from harm. I go and pick my daughter up and carry her, protesting, home. I'll finish with um, Daughter Song which is dedicated to Isla, my daughter Isla, but also goes out to my other daughter, Rose, <laughs> who doesn't have any poems of her own yet because she's still a baby. <laughs> daughter Song for Isla. Once all this is done, soaping you in the bath, your half songs and wet arms, and the owl in the woods behind the house, and the scream of a vole caught up, soaring through the boundless dark. And once all this is gone, the sea crept in from the dazzling bay, 
its mouth even now at the red cliffs. Once it's travelled in, and these high meadows are underwater entirely, the vetch rotted back, and the warrens flooded stumps, and the fox runs trampled by the current, and the fox herself long drowned. Still, my love for you will ride, ride on, like that star in the old songs, its long journeyed light, helpless and absolute. Yes, though it makes no sense, and I speak for your father also in this, our love is like that. It hurtles on and on, and you are its lodestone, and you are the ground it falls upon. <laughs>